Amen. You can be seated. If you would, give it up one more time for the student worship band. So, Hope College, I have the privilege to introduce you to my friend, Kishara Hudson. Kishara is an awesome sophomore. She's from Grand Rapids, and she's a social work major. Any social work? Shout out, social work. There you go. All right. And she's going to read the scripture today, which is Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 18. Now, therefore, reverse the Lord and serve him in sincerity, in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the God your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the, Lord's, then the people answered, Fair be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Ammonites who lived in the land. Therefore, also serve the God, for he is our God. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all give it up for Kishara for reading my scripture. Thank you so much. Yep. As we study the book of Judges, these words will confront us again and again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. However, those days and these days, those people and we people today are not all that different. As it has been since Adam threw his wife Eve under the bus, deflecting his own sin, human beings are born into rebellion against God. Like infants, so helpless, but yet so assertive. We, we don't know any better. And our hunger for autonomy is hazardous to our health. Without intervention, this fundamentally evil posture toward God pays only a salary of death. Sin is relentless. Sin is ever so calculating, and sin is entirely un. Bias, beauty, money, power, prestige, intellect, none of it can save. And since blood must be paid with blood, God in his mercy to the world that he so loved sent his son Jesus to set free those whom would just believe. And yet for an accurate history of our journey with God, in Judges were repeatedly offered this sobering reminder. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. So let's just take a step back in order to gain some perspective. The book of Joshua directly precedes Judges, so we're going to start there to help us better understand the issues that are at play. We have God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Israelites who follow God, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose irrefutable faithfulness has been tattooed on their soul, or so you would think. In Joshua 24, God recounts to them some high points of the epic love story that he has initiated. He's freed them from Egyptian captivity, and he's very graciously provided them undeserved victories over the Ammonites and others. Honestly, I mean, you could say that they've had it rather easy. 
God has done all of the heavy lifting of which they have directly benefited. So, so God says to them, I, I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built and, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive groves, olive yards that you did not plant. Despite their lousy track record of waywardness and grumbling, their trivial infighting and their spiritual adultery, God had been dependable. He was the picture of dependability uh, to perfection. They were still his covenant people. He was still their covenant-keeping God. But Joshua, who's been leading the Israelites for a while since Moses died, he's now himself close to death. And he knows how consistently inconsistent his people are. And so forceful and sharp, teeming with passion, his words arise from a place of protection. He hopes that his people, the people of God, his comrades in covenant arms will not abandon God, abandon God to sail in the prevailing attractive winds of a different belief system, the different belief systems that surrounded them, just like different belief systems surround us today. If they are to honor the end of the covenant that they're supposed to keep, to keep their hearts and minds loyal to God, then a moral contortionist they cannot be. Joshua warns them to not compromise. Just so you know, compromise is not a bad word. In fact, for the sake of honoring God, for the sake of extending deference and servanthood toward others, even those, particularly those you disagree with, this is all very much the Christian idea. In marriage, there must be compromise. In parenting, there must be compromise. No quality friendship can be sustained without compromise. You say that with me, compromise. Y'all, y'all got y'all to rock with me a little. Compromise. compromise. Y'all been so good to me. <laughs> Employers and employees accept that both parties must compromise if prosperity and institutional health are to be fully realized. But but this, this is the thing, there, there must be limits, limits, some values, more values than I would say that we care to admit, cannot be up for negotiation. This, this is like not new, this is a survival skill in as much as it is a core principle of Christian ethics. When tolerance, when tolerance mutates into idolatry, Compromise will have you making deals with the devil that you see as harmless. Perhaps you've noticed that some people just go along to get along. Maybe they date or marry someone who does not sincerely share their love for God, but whose physical features, come on somebody, or their their paycheck, or their personality, or their pedigree, or their, and this is the kicker, this is where missionary dating comes in, their potential is something that they value more. It's called compromise. Sometimes we we will give people privileged, intimate access to our life who we know. It's not a secret. Like, we really know that they are a negative influence in our life, but we do it because it's just easier to remain quiet and to, to feel liked. Bible calls that compromise. Starts with a C, ends with an E. Compromise. Insider trading. Compromise. Academic dishonesty. The professors are really on my side now. Compromise. Flirting and marital infidelity. Compromise. Oftentimes, all of these and so much more are regrettable casualties of compromise. And so straight up in verses 14 through 18, Joshua makes it plain. His instruction is that they should not give in, neither to the internal hounds of their own depravity or to external peer pressure. 
after this abbreviated retelling of how God has protected and and provided for them up to this point, he says in verse 14, now therefore, as if to say in in light of what you've, you've just heard, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put put away the gods that your ancestors served. We beyond that. We're trying to move to spiritual meat. Put away those gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And then, you know, this is, this is what I like. I'm get excited if y'all ain't. This, this is what I like. Joshua goes hard in the paint with the Israelites. He, he draws a line in the sand and he says, now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day, like not tomorrow, choose right now, right now, whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living right now. But, but as for me, like you, you do what you want. You got to make that choice for you and your family, for your kids. But for me, in my household, we will serve the Lord. You could have said amen right there, but you missed it. I, I want you to notice that Joshua, the leader, he himself cannot compromise his values so that he's then able with integrity to tell the people the message of God to not compromise theirs. His, his decision to challenge them was not dictated by anybody's opinion, but rather who he knew God to be for himself and also for the nation that he was leading. And to their credit, if, if only temporarily in the verses to follow, the Israelites did affirm God's goodness to them. And they said in verse 18, we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. A big temptation to compromising godly values is choosing to disregard something that I think we speed read through often in verse 14. It says to revere the Lord. This glaring omission leads to a kind of spineless Christianity or generous unorthodoxy. It leads, this this omission leads to spineless Christianity or a generous unorthodoxy. That means stuff that ain't in the Bible. These days, I would argue that we have a casual approach to, and a low-level appreciation of God, as if it's a given that He walks with us, and He talks with us, and He calls us His own, like He's obligated to field our prayers and to put up with our noncompliance. Reverence is is not some old-timey expression doing penance in yesteryear's lexicon when reading Rainbow with LeVar Burton was still popular. No, reverence is timeless. It it signifies this fear and and wonder, the, the absolute defiance with which we are expected to praise God. This is not the stuff of cheap lip service. If you're a person who takes notes, maybe you do, you know, you got your little journal, you do something on your phone, you you could write this down. The remedy to compromise is reverence. The remedy to compromise or the antidote to compromise or the solution to compromise is reverence. Your your feelings, you don't got to like me, your feelings are too unreliable. Your thoughts are too limiting. Your flesh is too dominant, but the Word of God is true. Another opportunity, y'all could have just shouted. The Bible is the only foundation worth building your life on, and doing that takes courage. In Matthew 10, 28 of the New Testament, we find this teaching, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. If Jesus is who he says he is in the Bible, and you've chosen to rock with him based on who he says he is in the Bible, 
as your faithful Savior in life and in death, then, then this is my question for you. What business do you have diluting God's truth just in order to gain acceptance from other people? That's a question. You, you could ponder that tonight before you study. For the record, to believe what you believe about God does not give you license to bully others into submission. I'll say that again. To believe what you believe does not give you license to bully people into submission. This is not the gospel. It also, though, does not mean you sit around like a bump on a log, hardly ever sharing anything so as to not offend someone. Some of the most passionate, the the most committed Christians I know are as cool and calm and collected as can be. They, They have wisdom and maturity on their side. They are not interested in arguing with you about everything under the sun with everybody, but they're also not wallflowers. If an opportunity arises for them to winsomely and accurately and passionately share what they believe, they show sure enough going to do it, and they don't care who's around. Another opportunity, man. Y'all missing these. As, as we will see in Judges as we continue on for these weeks, compromise that contradicts God is nothing, nothing to play with. Listen to these words from Lawson Stone, an Old Testament scholar at Asbury Theological Seminary. He writes, and I quote, Compromise, by its very nature, never announces itself as sin, but in its subtle degrees and shades, it undercuts the entire mission and life of the community of faith. As I close, let me tell you a story. My wife, she has a bad habit of not removing her contact lenses each evening. And so Monday of this past week, she began having pain in her right eye. And so as you you might imagine, after what became a very hurried trip to the ophthalmologist, we were told that she had a huge scratch on her cornea. A foreign body, seemingly her contact lens, was harming and both obstructing and restricting her vision. What initially she was flippantly figuring was probably no big deal turned out to be, oh, oh, a very big deal. And that's exactly how sin compromising God's truth works, which Joshua makes very plain. And so I I thank God for antibiotic and steroid eye drops that can correct that can heal what has distorted our vision in the physical, but especially in the spiritual. And Jesus is available to do that for you right now. Just like Joshua said, not tomorrow, not not yesterday, but like right now, Jesus is available to overcome your brokenness and your pain. He offers you an exit from the crooked badlands of false independence so that you can rest with him on higher ground in the land flowing with milk and honey. But to receive the gift, you got to do something now. You, you got to pledge allegiance to him. And that means you have to disavow or reject the wickedness of your former self. That's not popular. It's just true. The Bible contains no soteriological pluralism. That is to say, like, you think you can believe whatever you want to believe in, and somehow you're going to bust down the doors of heaven just because you said so. It don't work like that. This is the gospel. You, You accept God's offer of adoption into his family through Jesus, by grace, through faith, or you reject him completely. That's it. There's no middle way. There's no compromise. There's no situation in which God is ever going to change who he is to accommodate your opinion of him or your opinion of yourself. There's, there's no compromise. Christians are not to be porous, leaking with, with each flash flood of culture that hits their doorstep. In God's power, we're supposed to stand firm 
against every cunning thunderstorm of compromise, every hurricane of lust and greed that emanates from within. Grace abounds, I know, but there's no compromise. God loves you, yes, I would agree, but there's no compromise. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day, this day, whom you will serve. Amen. Amen.